Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing an important health topic during this National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. We're talking to leaders about the effects of this deadly disease and the importance of having access to life-saving resources like screenings. And with special guests, Chris Evans, president of the Colon Cancer Coalition in Minnesota, Carolyn Aldridge, founder and president of Prevent Cancer Foundation in Virginia, and Michelle Baker, director of philanthropy for Fight Colorectal Cancer in Missouri. So we've got the nation in front of us. And a reminder to Zoom attendees that we'll take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So thank you all for joining. It is so wonderful to, to see you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to gaining, to coming away from this discussion, way more informed that I entered into it. Um, but let's just set this up and we're going to go uh, to you, Chris, um, because unembarrassed stray talk uh, does save lives. I've had uh, people in my circle who have suffered from this and also have uh, sadly passed away um, after a, a long and valiant struggle. So we'll talk about uh, colorectal cancer, which is one of the most widespread cancers of men and women, uh, the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the United States. Very important to note. And also important to note is that uh, Black Americans are 20, uh, uh, up to a 20% uh, higher risk of contracting colorectal cancer, 40% um, proportionately uh, more die from this uh, disease and indigenous communities also have uh, higher rates. Rates uh, are rising in those under the age of 50 and it's a really, really big, big issue. So uh, Chris, could you just uh, help us to understand the dimension of this um, disease? And we're going to go around the table to talk a little bit about your operations and then we're gonna come back and talk about early detection and then uh, treatment and research. So Chris, you wanna take us away, please? Sure, I think what's important to what you said is that uh, colon cancer incidences and um, what we have a special situation with this cancer is you catch it before it turns to cancer. So you screen for this, you make people aware of it. People know the symptoms of colorectal cancer, but pre-colon cancer doesn't have symptoms. So the screening is so important. Um, the family history is so important to know when to get that screening so that we do catch it before you become one of these statistics. Um, just was on a, a very uh, interesting webinar with um, Virginia um, Department of Health where um, they mentioned that the preventative task force actually said that if you take away the barriers to screening and you take away the lag in um, treatment, um, for colorectal cancer once it's diagnosed, that the actual, the black American incidence of colorectal cancer is not that um, big of a discrepancy as, as we've seen. So it's about getting people screened and getting rid of the barriers to getting people screened. And that's what our organization is primarily focused on. So this is really important. So the, the downstream outcomes really come from upstream disparities. That's, that's the important point here. Yes. And Carolyn, when, when you're looking at, at that sort of screening piece. The thing that's so frustrating to me is that if you can if you can screen and if you can prevent, right, if you can reduce the number of incidents, our downstream costs and the downstream impacts on families uh, suddenly get really ameliorated. This is an this is something that we can actually do if we have the knowledge to do it. Carolyn? Oh yes, I'm sorry. Something popped up on my screen. Ah, it was it was one of our famous polls. Um, so when 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 we're talking about um, about prevention, we can actually by by taking action on an upstream basis, we can reduce the costs to families, uh, both in terms of uh, personal impact and also financial impact significantly, can't we? Absolutely. What I think is really important to know is this is one of really only two cancers that we can actually prevent through screening because we can find pre-cancerous polyps and they can be removed, um, particularly during a colonoscopy. But there are several ways of getting screened for colon cancer. And as we often say, the best test is the one you get. So there are choices. Um, often, if there are signs of 
colorectal cancer in a stool-based test, then that, that person needs to go ahead and have a colonoscopy. But it's not, it's not the only method of screening. Um, the alarming thing right now is the rise in colorectal cancer in younger adults. Why is that happening? There are a lot of theories about that, but colorectal cancer is very much related to diet, to being overweight, to being obese. There's a lot of a lot of uh, research right now into the impact of the microbiome on colorectal cancer. Lack and of lack of whole, whole foods and 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 uh, whole foods and exercise and cutting out processed meat, limiting intake of red meat whole grains, all, all those things are really important to help prevent colorectal cancer. But this society as a whole is getting heavier. We have more and more overweight and obese children. And so we're seeing young adults being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Um, so we've got to do something to stem that tide. Our foundation has a, an initiative called too young for this. It ends in an expletive, and so I'm not using that. But um, <laughs> it's a it's a very um, sassy and edgy campaign to try to make young adults aware of the symptoms because symptom awareness is really important. Because the the guideline now is screening at 45, but it happens much younger than 45. You know, it also seems, uh, Michelle, that we need to change our attitudes and we don't need to individually act a little bit differently. Um, what we're doing is we're selling products that are unhealthy, right? But I don't have to work for, for an organization that does that, right? We're encouraging um, behaviors that are unhealthy. I don't have to, as a policymaker, be doing that, right? I can actually think in terms of the fact that we don't want to be spending money and we don't want encouraging people to be spending money in in um, in terms of consuming uh, foods that are um, unhealthy. Now, we can't legislate that. Right. We can't we can't bunk people on the head, but we can make our own personal choices right on a voluntary basis to act in ways that that actually help other people. And, and we need to be thinking about that, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I think just, you know, in personal choices, we need to make sure that we are, you know, thinking about our family history, because that's a huge factor, number one factor in colorectal cancer. I myself am an example of that. And I lost my dad to colon cancer. So I started getting colon cancer screenings in, the, in my 20s and just recognizing that and understanding that this is my I have to do this for life. You know, I have to get screened and pay attention to that. But I also need to watch out what I eat. And, you know, because I do have a family history, but not even without with without the family history, um, I need to take care of my body. I need to listen to my body because even under the age of 45, people, our friends are being affected by colorectal cancer. So there are those choices that you need to make. But no matter what, you have to get screened. And that has to be a choice that everyone across the board needs to make. So That's, you, you she nailed it right there. Yeah, she nailed it right there because we have many young, healthy people getting colon cancer. So you can do everything right and still get colon cancer. It's the screening. I mean, Michelle just nailed it. So you you all do a lot of work in fundraising. Michelle is is a philanthropy, but you're all involved in in fundraising. Where does the money go, Chris? In other words, if if I'm making a donation, what do you spend that donation on? So we generally do 5K runs. And so all the donations that come in actually go into our programming. Um, so there's two pieces of, of, of money that comes in. The registration fees and things like that go to actually putting on the event. But the fundraising goes to local communities to um, into screening programs. Generally, I'll call it a fit to colonoscopy screening program for the under and uninsured in the various communities that we're in. So, so you're, you're targeting people whose health insurance will not pay for the screening or yep. who don't have health insurance. You're you're trying to make that screening available Correct. To, to everyone. That We're knocking down those barriers. That's our that's our job. Knocking down barriers. So, and Carolyn, yeah. do you do you do the same thing? Do you offer does your organization uh, offer those kinds or fund the, the those kinds of screenings in order to knock down those barriers as well? We have done that, but our organization is um, has 
it's sort of a multi-pronged approach. We fund research. So we have funded a lot of research in colorectal cancer, both um, in this country and globally, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. We do a lot of educational programs. I mentioned one called Too Young for This, but we developed the super colon and took it around the country. It's been to probably 150 communities around the country to educate people in, and take the, the stigma away so that it becomes fun. You can walk through a giant colon and see what can happen in, in the colon. We've gone everywhere from shopping malls to um, Native American reservations with this colon. And it's, it's just, it's been an amazing, um, really an amazing 10 year project. We also fund organizations, grassroots organizations in communities to do screening programs, to do educational programs. We reason that they know better what their community or and, and particularly their um, demographic, the, which most of which are underserved, um, they know better. And then, of course, as most nonprofits do, we do a certain amount of advocacy. We um, are proud to say that the reason there is a National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month official, officially designated is that we took the lead in 1999 and got both houses of Congress um, to proclaim March as Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And people told us it couldn't be done, that Congress didn't want to do any more uh, official months. But we got it done, and then we got a proclamation from the Clinton White House and from the Bush White House. So here we are 23 years later, and we're still going at it. Well, that's the thing, right? Civil society is not divided along party lines, right? So health is not divided along party lines, right, Michelle? I mean, you don't care... If, if I'm a Republican or a Democrat or or whatever, if I have colorectal cancer, you're going to help me. Absolutely. I mean, it's a bipartisan issue. You know, all of our policy efforts, we, it takes everyone. So it's going to take everyone across the board to find cures, to put money into research around colorectal cancer. So we bring in all of advocates around the country. They have legislators that are in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, Independent Party. But we just need to bring this issue to them and let them know that no matter what party you're in, you're a human and, and, and you're affected by this disease. And so we need to work together to make things happen, to change laws and to put funds and, and dollars into research to make advancements in treatment options for colorectal cancer. Patients. And what you're saying is true for so many other things, right? We need to be educated. We could say the same thing. We all need to be educated. We all we could say we all need clean air to breathe. Um, we could say so many things. Um, we can talk about so many things that unify us. Uh, we just completed one poll in which we asked uh, whether people had gotten screenings in the last year. Half said yes, half said no. And we're in the middle of another poll uh, right now, which which will be very interesting. We said, what are the what's the number one reason why screenings and colonoscopies are uh, get put off? And the number one reason, I have no symptoms and I have no family history, therefore I'm not at risk. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Um, that's the message right there. I think we've done a fantastic message of telling people the symptoms of colorectal cancer. I don't think we've done a, as great a message to tell them the importance of the screening to find the precancerous polyp. And How much does a screening cost? It can cost anywhere from free uh, to uh, you know probably a full full on colonoscopy three thousand uh, dollars. It depends on the thing. I mean, I hate to even use that, but that's kind of what we look at in our in our public health sector. So one point five million, I understand, uh, Carolyn, live with colorectal cancer at any one time in the United States. Is that correct, or or is my statistic off somewhat? Uh, that was correct at one time. I don't know if that's current. I think it is. But one thing that we really need to be aware of the fact that this pandemic has shifted people's um, screening yes. appointments. There have been so many missed and canceled postponed screening appointments very early in the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Ned Sharpless, who's the director of the National Cancer Institute, estimated that there would be an additional 10 million cancer deaths from breast cancer and colorectal cancer due to um, missed yeah. screening appointments. And we've done a lot of research in, in that. We have another campaign called Back on the Books, which is a public service campaign that's been remarkably successful in getting pick up, um, the messaging is get those screening appointments back on the books. And we've done 
um, market research, we've done surveys at four different time periods, and they have shown conclusively that the, the, the drop off in the early days of the pandemic, and then they began to pick up. We tried to get out the word that the screenings were safe. You could go into a hospital, that there were all kinds of safety precautions in place, or you could go into a screening facility. Um, and so there was pickup and it continued until the most recent, um, the most recent research we did showed that there had again been a drop off and that was likely due to the Omicron wave. So let's hope that now this this is going to this message will resonate and people will not find an excuse not to be screened, particularly for a cancer that most people don't want to be screened for. So well, and, and the reluctance, let's say you're you you focused on on uh, on all three items um, that um, that um, were preventative to um, to having people get screened. Um, the fact that they think that they have no symptoms, therefore they don't need to get screened, that it's embarrassing, it's painful, it's inconvenient, and, and so on, and high costs. I'd like to talk a little bit about education. And um, if, 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 if we were to pick up three facts, and I'm going to go around and start with Michelle, go to Chris, and then uh, end up with you, Carolyn, each pick one fact that I need to know, one thing that I need to know in order to uh, make me more knowledgeable about this. Michelle, what would you pick as the thing that I need to know about, uh, about this uh, condition? For me, because it's, it's a personal, it's personal for me. I, you know, your family history is vital and important. You know, whether or not you have a family history of polyps or actual um, colorectal cancer, knowing that is, is is imperative. And we have a friend at Blue Hat Foundation that says family secrets kill families. And so that is imperative that you have these conversations with your family members about your health, even expanding beyond colorectal cancer, but knowing your family history and what tests that you need to have um, to for preventative measures. So family history would be would be your number one thing that I should rem remember. Be aware. Yes. And always <laughs> age, age, you know, the recommended screening age range change to change from 50 to 45 during the pandemic. So to even piggyback to what Carol was saying, Carolyn was saying it is also 20 million people were dropped into this bucket um, after the screening age range was changed to be screened now. And to be completely honest, there's not enough GIs to screen all these people for colonoscopies. And so we do have to look at the different modalities and the less expensive um, options out there to screen everyone in our population that needs to be screened right now. And Chris, what is the thing that I need to know? What is the, the thing that, that you would add to what uh, Michelle said about family history? I think that um, the uh, I, the hesitancy, uh, being embarrassed, uh, the, the that part of it is, is something that uh, we work on pretty hard. And I think Carolyn has mentioned as well. I laugh at the names of her things. We have get your rear and gears and tour to tushes, and you know we're we're doing a Uranus campaign mission to Uranus right now, <laughs> and you know kind of get to the point where. You can discuss this with a friend or a family member without that um, bar it has a barrier, right? And and to to be able to tell your family history, to tell your family health history, I would just add to it. It's just it's not only your family; it's your friends. It's you know people need to talk to people about their health and keep up with their health. And and knowing that if you're very hesitant about a full colonoscopy, which is still the best way to take out the precancerous polyps and find them, there are at home screening methods, there are non-invasive screening methods out there. There's no excuse for somebody not to get screened. There's just no excuse. So let's just talk about it. Let's be, let's be aware. Let's talk about it. Let's get over ourselves yeah. and, and keep ourselves healthy. Right, Chris? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is a lifelong disease. It, if you have colon cancer and now you're NED, you're blessed to be NED, you have lifelong permanent health consequences from this disease. And, and, and you talked about the health, the, the burden on the healthcare system financially, the burden emotionally for people and on their families. Um, it destroys families. It, it destroys people's lives. It, it is very expensive and, it, and it's lifelong. It is a lifelong disease and it, a simple test to avoid that. 
a simple, very simple, inexpensive test to avoid that. The trade-off is just, it's not even a question with the trade-off. It's, it's just not even a question. Carolyn, adding now the, the issue of, of family history and getting over embarrassment, what is your counsel to us? What is the one thing that I can do to help my situation and to help the situation of my family? Make sure you're making healthy lifestyle choices. Um, as we mentioned earlier, obesity and overweight is a big risk factor for colorectal cancer, lack of physical activity, what you actually consume in the way of um, processed meats, for example, and, and not having a diet that's based on whole foods, whole grains. So diet and physical activity are probably as implicated in colorectal cancer as they are in any disease. And finally, not smoking, because smoking is known to be a risk factor for colorectal cancer. You know, I've, everything that you mentioned, every single thing that you mentioned has, has downstream consequences uh, that, that um, include colorectal cancer, but other consequences as well. Um, it's, it, it, it's so much a question of, of our behaviors, our addictions, and, and the incentives that are built into to our system. This is where the power of the individual and the power of sort of talking with family members can make itself felt. I'm not sure that you can regulate human behavior, but you can advocate and based in knowledge, change it, right? I mean, we all have that power, don't we, Carolyn? I think we do, absolutely. And it's harder. People who lived in certain underserved communities, if they live in food deserts, for example, it's harder to have that healthy diet. But if people know what they should be and shouldn't be consuming, at least they can start making progress and they can certainly cut out tobacco. I know it's an addictive habit, but we need to we need to make sure that combustible tobacco products disappear from the face of the earth. Um, let's talk about the um, the elephant in the room, um, which is money. Um, we just completed a poll with very surprising results, I might add. We said, how should the cost of colonoscopies be funded? Be funded. And we gave two choices. One is uh, they should be funded by the patient, their insurance or government programs. We didn't make any differentiation there. Um, and the, the other choice is if... If people can afford it, they can get it. And if people can't afford it, they don't. Nobody voted for that latter piece. Oh, good. <laughs> Everybody voted. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting yeah. because very often the way these discussions are couched is uh, income redistribution or whatever, or defense of, of, of the, the, the system that we currently have. But what we're talking about here is a unanimous vote that there, is a, there are certain aspects of health that is in the common interest of America and not just an individual interest in which mm -hmm. as long as I get mine, it's OK if you don't get yours. Right. So let's talk about how do we how do we make this change? Because we've we've talked about ad nauseum. Right. Our our health system and our funding system for, for health services, Chris. And you're trying to put your finger in the dike, but you know, it's it's tough for nonprofits to 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 uh to really um, stop this. How do we deal with that issue that we have huge numbers of people and uh, aligned by um economics, right? Which very often aligns by race, which is one of the reasons why. Uh, African Americans are so impacted, Indigenous Americans are so impacted. How do we deal with this, Chris? Well, I, I will say that I don't do this alone. Um, I don't think there's a provider in this United States. Uh, I don't think there's a clinic in this United States who doesn't somehow uh, help us with some free colonoscopy, free colonoscopy days, some screening programs. Um, I, I so I'm not going to say we do this alone. I do plug the niches where the people need the funding, where they're they're right. missing the funding. Um, and there's been some legislation lately, and I am darn sure Michelle's better at explaining this than I am. But uh, it closed that gap for colonoscopies. If you went in for a screening colonoscopy and it turned out you had a polyp, then there's a diagnostic piece, which then sometimes you had a surprise bill for, and um, that that I think has been 
way beyond my time, people fighting for that change. So there is some changes within the insurance industry um, that need to happen. Um, and there's just an advocacy. You have to advocate for yourself and find the resources. I believe they're out there. Uh, it's just when you don't want to go get a test, it's not a test that you particularly like. Um, you can find a lot of reasons not to go, uh, a lot of barriers not to get over, but there are resources out there. And um, there's our organizations, uh, there's quite a few more of us than what you see on this on this call. Uh, most of us have some way of directing a person who needs a colonoscopy into a colonoscopy. Oh, every every state, every yeah. state. We're, every we're, city. we're talking yep. about three three states. Yep. We're talking about three organizations, but there's so many hundreds yep. of of, uh, of organizations like yours, uh, Michelle. In terms of in terms of dealing with this with this cost issue, can't we just also deal with it from a pure dollars and cents? Um, perspective. I mean, if we can reduce the the number of people who um, are afflicted by this disease on an upstream basis, we're going to have a net, net, net financial advantage. I mean, let alone the emotional yeah. impact that, that people suffer, right? And the, the economy gets stronger, right? Yes, absolutely. And to um, Chris's point, as far as the removing barriers to screening within Medicare, that was one of the specific talking points we would meet with members of Congress that if you screen people today, you save money later. And look, we've already we already always talk about, you know, Medicare, is there going to be money 20 years from now for in Medicare or whatnot? This is an opportunity to save money within Medicare. We need to make sure that there aren't barriers within our Medicare population to be screened. And so that way they can be screened at the appropriate time. And so that way they're not actually putting this cost barrier, you know, putting this cost onto Medicare, and which is, is actual a burden to our whole entire system. And so I think there's also the way of raising awareness around, um, you know, we look at colonoscopy, it takes a lot for a colonoscopy of the anesthesiologist, you know, it takes a team to put on a colonoscopy. And so what we want need to do is continue to put awareness out there about the different modalities and options for screening that are, you know, you don't have to take time off work for a colonoscopy. But I think it's also important to, to show that we've come a long way within the past 10 years with screening options and that there's some exciting things on the horizon within blood tests. And can you just imagine if you can get a blood test for screening colonoscopy, what that would do as far as our incident and mortality rates. So I think we just Carolyn, need to keep pushing on the research and the research being funded. And Carolyn, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, it, it, you're in Virginia, you're you're in the shadow of, of our national government. And we've already referred to the fact that this is not a, a party issue, right? This affects all Americans. It affects people throughout the world. Could you talk a little bit about your work to affect deciders in this country, whether it's it's at the national level, at the state level, um, uh, medical uh, professionals, insurance uh, industries, how do we affect those decisions so that we have a much better downstream uh, result for this country, for everyone in the country? Do we have another hour? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. And how we do it is just one step at a time and one meeting at a time, focusing our energy on the people who can really help make these things happen. Um, our work is mostly at the federal level, as you said. Um, the, the, there's a lot going on in states, but we don't have state chapters. And so we're, we're a, a Virginia-based uh, organization, and we are right across the bridge from Capitol Hill. So right. we do manage to um, to have a, a pretty strong presence on Capitol Hill, and, and we've worked on that colonoscopy loophole for years, and it finally got passed. And I think a similar one is in the works to, um, to not, if someone has a positive finding on a stool test, then and has to have a colonoscopy that is still considered to be a screening colonoscopy as opposed to a diagnostic colonoscopy and all the surprise bills that can come along with that. So it's it's literally one step at a time, and we know it's um, a process. And it, and it's not stopping. I think it really does come down to incentivizing collaboration to solve problems as opposed to incentivizing divisive discussions where people can go into their corners and not get anything done and, and try and uh, simply win elections for themselves. Let's get something done for people. Chris Evans, 
president of colon cancer of the colon cancer coalition in Minnesota, Carolyn Aldridge, founder and president of Prevent Cancer of the Prevent Cancer Foundation in Virginia, and Michelle Baker, director of philanthropy of Fight Colorectal Cancer in Missouri. Thank you so much for helping us out. It is just so wonderful to have you here. And everybody, try and get screened. Encourage knowledge of your own family history and let's not be embarrassed about something that is so important to to our health. Uh, Please join us on Tuesday where we will also be talking about an associated topic. We will be recognizing National Doctor Day by talking with nonprofits that support foundations for medical students. So thank you all, everybody stay safe. It's just been a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.